I'd like to welcome everybody to worship today uh, here at MCC Richmond and all of the people that are joining us online. Um, you made it, so uh, relax and uh, enjoy. Um, I hope that uh, you will get as much out of our service this morning as I know that I will. Um, if you haven't already, uh, if you're at home, um, please uh, feel free to get yourself a piece of bread or a cracker and a little bit of juice to join us for Holy Communion a little bit later on in the sanctu- a little bit later on in the service. If you're here in the sanctuary and you didn't get a communion cup on the way in, um, just raise your hand and uh, Tom will bring one to you. Okay. Um, remember to send an email to Pastor Kenny, um, letting him know where you were when you watched the service this morning. He gets a kick out of that, and it's an indication of how far our word reaches. In the last week, he received emails from people in New York, Alabama, Minnesota, Texas, Canada, Michigan, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Germany, and uh, I would like to be in Germany right now, Wisconsin, Hawaii, Georgia, India, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Washington, Amsterdam, I wonder who that might have been, (laughs) Ohio, North Dakota, Richmond, Glen Allen, and no list is complete without adding Chesterfield. So thank you all uh, here and online for joining us. We give thanks for our growing spiritual community and, and that our church is as healthy as it is. So uh, please, uh, let's continue to worship as we sing, This is the Day. Let us set the intention for our service this morning as we hear the words of Reverend Sharon Wiley. We speak so often of brokenness in religious life. Let us speak today of wholeness. You are welcome here, all of you, every part of you beautiful just the way you are. Here you do not need to be something more or something less. There's no holding back. There's no hiding, no exerting yourself, no trying to do more or be more. You have inherent worth and dignity. Nothing to prove here. Nothing to prove to me or the person sitting next to you or to the children or to anyone. You don't have to try and be witty or more quiet or more outgoing. You are beautiful, every part of you beautiful just the way you are. You do not need to change anything about yourself to be welcome here. Your skin, your hair, your belly, your limbs, your face, all beautiful just the way they are. You are extraordinary, each and every one of you different from each and every beautiful in your own beautiful way, breathtaking. Let us worship together. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of 
church. We welcome you to our service this morning. We welcome the folks that are attending virtually as well as the folks that are present here today. We welcome the Holy Spirit. We welcome the movement of the breath of God. We welcome all. Let's remind ourselves of our greeting by saying it together. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done, how you love, or who you love, God welcomes you and so do we. You are welcome here. I invite you to close your eyes and concentrate on your breathing. Hear the sound of your own breath. Recognize the rhythmic moving in and out of life-giving oxygen and life-giving carbon dioxide. Remember your connection to all green living things. Plants breathe out the oxygen that we require and we breathe out the carbon dioxide that plants require. This is God's perfect plan Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in oxygen. Breathe out carbon dioxide. Breathe in the presence of God. Breathe out God's love. Our candles in the sanctuary are lit today, signifying God's presence and our community. Those of you at home, we welcome you to light your own candle at this time. One single candle makes a huge difference. Many, many candles turn night into day and darkness into light. Light your candle. Hear the strike of the match and the sizzle of the wick. Know that God is here. God's Spirit quickens our sparks into flames. May God fill your heart, mind, and spirit as we proceed together with our service. Amen.
morning church and our church members online and all those listening to us today will you pray with me please God of grace God of mercy we come to you today thankful for the beautiful fall weather we're experiencing here in Richmond today and for this congregation of friends this family who worships you together and for the love we share Yet we also know that there are other families who have no electricity or water and who may have faced the devastation of losing their loved ones or their homes or all their possessions as a result of weather gone awry in the horrors of Hurricane Ida. We feel the despair of families fleeing from their homes as fires engulf many areas of the western United States. We understand the fear of our Afghan allies left behind to face the Taliban and the bewilderment of those who are now facing the prospect of a new life in a strange land. We feel the desolation felt by women in Texas and those in other states that are preparing to pass strict abortion laws. We understand the urgency facing voters as they attempt to stymie regressive prejudice laws limiting voting rights. Let your grace and mercy flow down to each and every individual whose future looks bleak at this current moment because of global warming, wars, or partiality. And may we, each of us, be vessels of love and support for those who are facing crises in their lives or those whose lives have been in crisis for a long time. We now pray for those who are facing illness or hunger or hopelessness or discrimination or fear. And merciful God, we now lift up the names of those we know and love to your loving care as we call them out. Be with each and every one of those whose names have been called out and those unnamed who still are in need of your grace and mercy. We are saved by your grace and we give you thanks for your redeeming love and for the knowledge that you are always with us. We praise you, God of the ages. And God, may each of us try to be your eyes, your hands, your arms and your ears as we work toward a better world for all, one small step at a time. In the name of the one who taught us to love, Jesus Christ, and in all of your many names, we ask this prayer. Amen. Same, God, our name, El 
Today's sacred text is Mark 7, 24 through 37. Jesus left that place and went into the region of Tyre. He didn't want anyone to know that he had entered a house, but he couldn't hide. In fact, a woman whose young daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard about him right away. She came and fell at his feet. The woman was great Greek Seraphonician by birth. She begged Jesus to throw the demon out of her daughter. He responded, the children have to be fed first. It isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But she answered, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Good answer, he said, go on home. The demon has already left your daughter. When she returned to her house, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon was gone. After leaving the region of Tyre, Jesus went through Sidon toward the Galilee Sea, through the region of the 10 cities. Some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged him to place his hand on the man for healing. Jesus took him away from the crowd by himself and put his fingers in the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Looking into heaven, Jesus sighed deeply and said, Ephatha, which means open up. At once his ears opened, his twisted tongue was released, and he began to speak clearly. Jesus gave the people strict orders not to tell anyone, but the more he tried to silence them, the more eagerly they shared the news. People were overcome with wonder, saying, he does everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who can't speak. Hallelujah, 
Well, thank you, spirits of joy. And all the people said amen. amen. <laughs> well, I want to thank you um, for allowing me to be with you today and for Pastor Kenny giving me another opportunity to speak to you. Um, it's been an interesting week for me in working through this scripture. And I'll have to admit the fact that I gave him the title and the, and the scripture without having all of my ideas form, formulated. So, it's been good to see it come together. <laughs> so today, Pastor Kenny's direction to me was, speak about one word. We're in a one word theme series. So there are five passages in the lectionary that talk uh, to us from both Psalms and Proverbs and James and Mark. And out of those five different passages, my word is impartiality. So let's get into this. The main part of the scripture you heard, and thank you Darlene and Sally for doing such a great job reading that scripture. You heard that main part, but you didn't hear the other background passages. So I'm going to introduce you to those as we go through, uh, just briefly. It's kind of like being in an airplane looking down. But we, the passage about the Syrophoenician woman and the deaf mute, we will look at very closely. So you'll hear those stories again. But first, let's think about impartiality. An online dictionary defines it as equal treatment of all rivals, fairness. Synonyms are lack of favoritism, even-handedness. I like those words. I think those are good words to think on. So the Hebrew scripture reference from Proverbs 22 reminds us that both rich and poor have a common bond because they've all been created by God. That passage further reminds us that God pleads the case of the poor. God acts as a paraclete or a helper. And that action is demonstrated in, advoca in advocacy, if I can say that word today. Big word, advocacy. I want you to make the connection between impartiality and advocacy. So think about it. God pleads the case for the poor. God is an advocate for the disenfranchised. If you and I choose to show a preference for the rich over the poor, we are opposing God's impartiality. Psalms 125 speaks very briefly about God encircling his people, or God's people, I should say. God surrounds them, God protects them. Once again, we see this vi visual image of God acting as an advocate. God serves as a paraclete or a helper. James 2 admonishes us to not, to, to not treat the people who come into our midst with partiality. We're not to bestow honor upon the person who comes in wearing the gold ring over the person who comes in wearing tattered clothing. We are not to give preference for class or position. Seeking to identify ourselves with the rich and the famous rather than the poor and unknown. The writer of James is clear when he says that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves and not to show partiality. In fact, James goes so far that he says any partiality is missing the mark. And those who fail in this way are transgressors of the law. Now think about the myriad of ways in which you and I prejudge, we compare, and we define one another. We do it without thinking because it comes naturally. We don't have to practice at this it comes naturally to us. So, the thoughts that I have today would be how do we move from that natural approach to a natural approach that includes 
And I think MCC Richmond does a great job of setting an example with that. I want you to think about all of the family stories of favored children that you know. Maybe you grew up in a family where a child was favored. You might have been the favored child or the unfavored child, but this hits home with many of us. This family system has negative impacts. The favored child receives more than their fair share. The favored child does not have to work as hard as the others. The favored child is readily praised and is elevated in the eyes of, of one or both parents. They may be elevated because they're beautiful people. It may have something to do with their appearance or their intelligence or their athletic prowess. But whatever the case, the results are devastating for the ones not chosen. If you live in a family where you are the only child, you can be the favored one. But in my experience, when there is more than one child, the favored one will cause problems. Now, y'all may not believe this, but in 1980, there was a movie called Ordinary People, and I was old enough to watch that movie. <laughs> in fact, I was 23 years old. And in that movie, we're introduced to a family where the favored son had died in a tragic accident. The remaining living, less favored son, is overcome with grief, but he's also assaulted with the realization that he was loved as second best. He does not measure up to the expectations of his parents, particularly his mother. That a part was played by Mary Tyler Moore, which many of you know and love. This deeply moving film eventually leaves us somewhat mollified as the father chooses to accept this younger son, the living son, as a person of value, worth loving, and worth fighting for. The father's love literally takes the action to save the life of this second son. The second son struggles with suicidal guilt and low self-esteem, and at the end of the movie, we see what is happening. The mother is lost. She is unable to move through her grief, and she's unable to accept the living son because he is not the favored son. Without the favored son, she doesn't have to know how to move forward with her life. The dissolution of the marriage is implied, but the survival of the second son is also indicated. This movie is just one illustration of the crippling impact of partiality. Note the irony of the title, Ordinary People. Partiality is more ordinary than we care to admit. So, let's get up close and personal with the Syrophoenician woman and the deaf mute. Now here's where we're going to really look at Mark. So in the first story, it appears that a Gentile woman opens up Jesus' eyes about partiality. This scripture is intriguing to me because it presents Jesus in a light where we normally don't see him. There's something contradictory here. So, as far as the setting, Jesus is retreating from his Galilean ministry. He's tired, and he's in need of rest. He needs privacy, and he needs time to regroup. And I'm getting that from, the, from that initial statement that says he needed to be away. Think about where he is physically. He's traveled north out of Palestine into Gentile territory. And this city named Tyre is located on the Mediterranean Sea. It's a coastal city. It's in the province of Syria. So this is Gentile territory. Mark tells us that Jesus didn't want anyone to know he was there. And Mark says, Jesus couldn't hide. Now that raises questions for me. What was going on with Jesus? Why did he need to hide? Who was he hiding from? 
Is this a case of burnout? Or is this a time for discernment? We aren't clear, Mark doesn't tell us, and we're going to make assumptions, which is what we do when we read the Bible together. So at any rate, Jesus must not have been at his best. So at this time when he needed peace and quiet, this brassy Syrophoenician woman breaks into the house and falls at his feet. And what does she do? She is begging him to throw a demon out of her daughter. The word begged here means to implore, to appeal to. So the Syrophoenician woman is an advocate for her daughter. We don't get a description of the demon, but one of the commentaries I read said that if you look at Mark 9, you'll probably see that description. And here's what Mark 9 says. A young man stiffened, he foamed at the mouth, and he fell to the ground. So this sounds like our modern day epilepsy, doesn't it? The daughter may have been having seizures that were very frightening for the mother to witness. I've lived 64 years, and I've never seen a person have a seizure. But in July of this year, I witnessed our, dog, our husky dog, Tyson, have two of them. And I had never felt so helpless as when I watched our husky fall over, shake, foam at the mouth, injure his teeth, and all I could do was wait until it was over. So imagine if that is your daughter having that experience. How frightening that must have been for the Syrophoenician woman. So we know where she's coming from. And at this juncture, Jesus says something that doesn't sound like Jesus. He tells her it's not right to take the children's food and feed it to the dogs. He appears to be referencing the fact that she's a Gentile. The Jews called the Gentiles dogs. Talk about partiality. So they didn't even view the Gentiles as human. And so Jesus is standing in between this time of, of knowing a ministry to the Jews and being accosted by a Gentile who seeks his ministry. So if the Gentiles were considered to be dogs, Jesus has raised this question with this woman. What does that raise for you in our minds today? Who is not considered to be as human as others? You can fill in the blanks, but here are some of them. The poor, the uneducated, the deaf, the blind, those with cerebral palsy, those who have birthmarks, those who are intellectually disabled, gay people, black people, in some cases women. These are the categories that we put people in to think about them as being less than human. Who gets treated partially as inferior? It means they don't measure up. It means they are helpless and hopeless because of our prejudice. When you and I are partial to a group, we are automatically partial against other groups. That's how it works. We choose favorites. We eliminate or we denigrate the unfavored. We put people in groups of who is in and who is out. When I was in elementary school, I remember people asking me questions like, are there any good people in your class? And at that point in my life, I was not really sure what that meant. But good meant popular. So here we are. We're making more and more classes. Did Jesus do that with the Syrophoenician woman? when he considered that she, as a dog, would not be worthy of taking the food from the children? I don't know that answer, but it's implied to me 
But what I'm really grateful for is that Syrophoenician woman didn't leave it there. She didn't let Jesus stop there. She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the children's table. In other words, she's asking for the crumbs of what God could do for her and her daughter. She is satisfied with eating off the floor, taking only the pieces that drop as long as they're enough to bring the results that she seeks. Have you ever been so desperate that you're going to eat the food off the floor? Thankfully, Jesus hears her voice. He appears to change his mind about her value. She's a not, she is not a dog. She's another human. She is granted her request. And Jesus heals her daughter by voice. He doesn't touch her. He doesn't see her. He's not even close enough for her to hear him. When this persistent mother arrives home, her daughter is found to be healed. I want you to hear this. In all of the Gospel of Mark, only one person refers to Jesus as Lord, which means master, ruler, sovereign. That one person is this Syrophoenician woman. This story is not in Luke, and it's altered in Matthew, but in Mark, biblical scholars think that the story actually illustrates Jesus coming to grips with the fact that his ministry was for all people, not just the Jews. So that Syrophoenician woman did you and I a favor as we sit here in our Gentile identity. People like you and me who might have been sorted by race at some time. She was an advocate for her daughter, but she served to advocate for you and I. So let's talk about the deaf mute. This is another controversial depiction of Jesus' ministry. Following the illustration of impartiality to whore Gentiles with the Syrophoenician woman, we now have a story about a disabled individual. I had a good friend in college whose father stuttered. I went to their home for a meal at one point, and the family dynamics were hugely interesting. The father would try to talk and the mother would finish the sentences. The father grew frustrated and the mother appeared to be embarrassed. This was a very intelligent man holding a very high paying job in Montgomery County, Maryland in the late 1970s. And yet at one point he said to me that his stuttering made people think he was intellectually disabled. A physical deformity so visual to others oftentimes places individuals in a group that includes all disability. We respond to them as if they are deaf even though they are only blind. We respond to them as if they are intellectually disabled even though they only have cerebral palsy. We lump them into a category that is less valued, less equal, less apart because we've judged their limitations before we understand their disability. Folks, I've got to tell you, we all have a disability. Yours may not be as visible as a deaf mute man's, but you have one because you and I walk the feet, walk the world with feet of clay. And that is our disability in many ways. So what Jesus has done here is he's traveling. If you can envision Palestine, he went north to Tyre, and then he went further north to Sidon, and then he came south, and then he wrapped around the Sea of Galilee to an area called Decapolis, which is 10 cities, and that's where he is now. And what's interesting is this is still not Jewish territory. This is a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. The deaf and mute man is not identified as either Jew or Gentile. But I am suspicious of the fact that this is another illustration of Jesus reaching out to the Gentiles. Could it be that this deaf mute man is also waiting to receive crumbs from Jesus' table? 
This man had friends, friends who loved him enough to take him to Jesus and implore him to heal. They were acting as advocates for their friend. This story tells a whole lot more about Jesus' healing technique than most that we hear. He took the man away from the crowd. He put his fingers in the man's ears. He put his own spittle on the man's tongue. He looked to heaven, he sighed deeply, and he demanded, open up. In Mark's typical pattern, the healing was immediate. So I was part of a college drama and musical team called Seed Company back in the 70s, and one of the short dramas we presented told this story. And one of the lines was that Jesus would not do such a dirty thing as to spit on another human being. And yet, the Bible tells us he did. The truth is that spit was considered to have curative powers during that time. And you think about it, <laughs> what do children do when they cut their finger? They put it in their mouth. There is something about that that in our mind helps stop the bleeding or helps the healing. So not so far fetched. But the fact that it's included in the biblical record says to me this is important. It's significant. Mark wrote it in there, so there's a reason for it. Mark also chose to include the fact that Jesus sighed deeply before he demanded that the man's ears and tongue be healed. It makes me think that healing cost Jesus something. Consider what you sigh about. A deep sigh means something. It's pain. There's a physical and an emotional element there that says many words, even though there's only one sound. I can remember my mother coming home from work, and she was a nurse, and she would immediately come in and fix dinner. And when we sat down at the table, invariably, my mother and the six children and my father, my mother would sigh. because it took a lot to get there. <laughs> it took a lot. A sigh means there's a cost. And so we have this second uh, miraculous healing and it's brought about by the advocacy of this deaf and mute man's friends. It's something to celebrate, right? But Jesus says, don't tell anyone. There is a theme in the Gospel of Mark called the Messianic Secret, and that continues to show up, and it shows up here. It means that um, Mark didn't want people to focus on who Jesus was until the time was appropriate. For now, you and I just need to accept the fact that Jesus demonstrated impartiality toward a man who was normally lumped into a group of the less fortunate, the less important, the less valued. People glanced at this man, they saw his disability, and they assumed they knew who he was. But in fact, he might have been a symbol to show that there was a language barrier between the Jews and the Gentiles, and Jesus is the one that brings healing to that. It also could have been the fact that there was a barrier between unclean and clean people, however you interpret that. And Jesus brings healing to that. I love it. Jesus, what Jesus told the people not to do is exactly what they did. He told them, don't tell anyone that I just healed a man who couldn't speak. And so with their own voice, their own words, they went and told what Jesus had done. He healed a man who couldn't speak. So I've tried to paint a little picture for you today about impartiality. And I've tried to link that word with the idea of being an advocate for others. What does impartiality look like to you and where in your life 
do you need to make changes? As the father of six children, I remember how important it was to me, for me to treat each child as much the same as possible. We kept tallies on how much we spent on each child at Christmas. I still have the notebook, so I can prove it to you. <laughs> each birthday brought a gift value to the same amount. The Easter baskets, we measured out M&Ms by teaspoons, so everybody would get approximately the same amount. When the kids started talking about more of one color than another, I gave up on that one, but I could tell them, you got four teaspoons of M&Ms and that's your fair share. We were an advocate for each child being treated equally. We did not do it perfectly, but that overarching desire to be impartial was certainly what governed my experience with my children. I want to conclude with these thoughts. From these scriptures, impartiality means that persons are accepted for who they are, not for the way we want them to be. Impartiality means that barriers to self-actualization are not experienced because of external characteristics such as skin color, hair color, body weight, disability, gender, sexual orientation, race, nationality, religion, etc. You see there's a connection here. Our state and federal laws against discrimination have in their seminal form a protection against partiality. The law stands as an advocate just as the Syrophoenician woman advocated for her daughter and the deaf mute's friends advocated for him. Impartiality requires advocacy. It's work. It's going to take something from you, just like healing took something from Jesus. You're going to sigh as you practice impartiality. The great thing about that healing approach is that people get to experience the healing. They get to see it and tell it, and they get to feel what it feels like to be accepted, to be seen, to be heard. We can reap the benefits of being judged rightly, not wrongly. So, I challenge you to be an advocate for impartiality. And thank God for the Syrophoenician woman, that brassy woman who would not let Jesus rest. Amen. bulletin I went wait a minute I did the call to offering last week and then I realized how could I be doubly blessed so I got a little uh, instant poll how many of you feel blessed I think I see just about everybody that is impartiality of God's love now how do we determine how blessed we are well, I love the analogy of the Easter basket. 
because God gave a gift of an Easter basket to each and every one of us. And if we are able to look into that Easter basket, there are jelly beans to be had. And we can count those jelly beans, which are our blessings. And we can take joy in the wondrous gift that it is. Except, how often do we take time to glance over at Sharon or Les's or MJ's Easter basket and try to determine what's inside their Easter basket? Maybe we can see jelly beans and they're not as many. Do we feel more blessed? Nothing changed in our life other than we counted or tried to count their Easter basket jelly beans. Maybe they have more jelly beans. How many times have we looked at the people with the richer jelly beans and went, I don't feel as blessed anymore. What a wondrous thing it is to be able to focus on God's blessings to us in our own Easter basket. And as we do the call to offering, we call and ask each of you to look into your heart and return some jelly beans to your creator. And now we'll continue on with our offering giving response. We are an offering. <laughs> Remember that Jesus is the host of this meal, and Jesus turns no one away. Come now, just as you are, and experience the sacred time with God. Let us observe a moment of reflection as we silently confess our concerns and shortcomings to God before we are fed this holy meal. Let us now say together, loving and gracious God, forgive those things we have done and left undone that have caused pain to you, others, and ourselves. Help us to learn from these things and remind us of your forgiving presence and transforming love. Blessed of God, through the life and ministry of Jesus, God forgives us, heals us, and showers us with gifts of love, hope, and grace, just the way we are, and welcomes us to this feast of victory in life. In the many names of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, we embrace all that is holy as we say together, Holy One, God of power and might, you fill the earth with your justice and transforming love. Blessed is the one who brings hope and welcome to all. All praise, glory, and honor to you, O God. We remember Jesus' promise to his disciples long ago and to us that he will always be with us. We remember on the night before his betrayal and arrest, Jesus took bread gave thanks for it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, 
Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember how after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink Drink this, all of you. This This is my my love love poured out out for you and for everyone. everyone. Whenever Whenever you drink drink it, do this in remembrance of me. By the love and grace of God, may this bread and this cup be the body and love of Jesus for us and with us. In preparation for sharing this meal and mystery, let us say together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy dominion come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us partake of God's gifts of forgiveness, love, and grace. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have blessed us with this holy meal. You have renewed us and refreshed us and revived us. We ask now that you will hold each one of us in your loving care and that you will guide us on our journey this week. And We ask all of these things in all of your holy names and in the name of Jesus the Savior. Amen. Amen. I have just a few announcements. Um, First of all, thank you for sharing worship with us today. It's great to see everyone and to be seen by you. Thank you so much. The church office will be closed on Monday in observance of of Labor Day. Um, We have begun participating in a clothing drive for Afghanistan refugees. Um, We're collecting clothing. Uh, All types of clothing is needed. Underwear, socks, shoes, pants, shirts, skirts, dresses, scarves of all sizes. Um, Donations can be dropped off at the church office and we'll take them then to Fort Lee for distribution. Be sure and send Pastor Kenny an email. Please send Pastor Kenny an email telling him where you worship from today. Um, He likes that. We all like that. We like to see that uh, our voices are reaching uh, far and wide. So please do that. His email address is godguykenny at gmail.com. And this week and always remember, all will be well. Thank you. Be well, be well, all will be